Well, the big show everybody wa is watching or has been watching right now is White Lotus, which just had its season two finale last night. I'm a big fan of the show, did not love uh, the finale, but we definitely wanted to talk about it here on Rising. So I'm joined, Bach and I are joined by a columnist for Newsweek and co-host of Low Society podcast, Angie Speaks, who is going to give us her take. Spoilers for any of you watching, we're gonna discuss White Lotus here. I don't wanna hear any complaints that I didn't <laughs> warn you or prepare you. I get myself in trouble with spoilers all the time, Bacha, all the time. Um, good to see you, Angie. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, uh, what did, so what did you make of the finale overall? And then I know you wanted to sp uh, speak specifically, and you've written for Newsweek, um, about how sex work was portrayed in this season. Yes, definitely. I, I thought the season finale was slightly anticlimactic, uh, personally, but I really did enjoy the show because I felt it kind of gave some insight into current prevailing attitudes, especially when it came to sex work. Um, the two sex work, the two sex worker characters, have kind of become icons of like aspirational femininity among like a certain subset of like women online, um, because their story arc is so like fabulous and so glamorous, <laughs> and there are very few consequences uh, you see actually happen for the very opportunistic um, behavior that they engage in. Um, yeah, so I found that pretty interesting. It was interesting, because I wouldn't say necessarily that they were portrayed, um, like they were, uh, so they, they were con artists of a sort, so the, the one sort of, I mean, not in a, not in a, like an extremely, I, I guess I, I guess also the people were, they were conning were easily conned and were like happy to go along with it sort of so the one kind of uh, sleeps her way talks her way etc into this job at the hotel that she really wanted and then the other one kind of more aggressively I, I you know gets like fifty thousand well, euros I don't know how many dollars that is out of uh, out of one of the characters that she's been sleeping with it like kind of implies that she needs it because she's facing violence and that's like that's very clear to the I think to the audience that that's not really the scenario that like she cooked this up with a friend um, and and then act and then Technically, there's actually like a third sort of sex worker character, right? The the guy um, who uh, who ends up kind of kidnapping briefly one of the characters and seems to be aware of this kind of insane murder plot going on. So it anyway, they're not portrayed as like straightforward, sort of honest people necessarily. But I guess you're right that they're not. They're definitely not spun as bad. And then the work that they're doing is not portrayed as like I don't know beneath human dignity or something. Yeah, and especially the sort of response that it's gotten. Like I said, these girls are kind of, they've been sort of deified by athletes on like TikTok as like these icons of like empowered uh, modern mm. femininity. Um, and it's sort of a running motif in a lot of media that's like resonating with like young kind of adult emerging audiences um, that sort of has this like fast life theme doing anything to sort of get ahead, um, to sort of transcend the mundanity of like maybe not the best uh, economic situation and um, attain this sort of ideal like of glamour. Um, and even with like cryptocurrency scams that you see happening, <laughs> there's this notion of trying to find like a fast way or like a cheat sheet to the top and sex work is sort of filling that void um, for women in the same way that like cryptocurrency is for like guys in a way. Mm. That's so interesting, Angie. To talk us through, yeah, the what it means, the sort of girl bossification of sex work, right? <laughs> what does that mean both about um, our economic politics, but also about our gender politics in this moment? Like, what does that say about us as a society? I think I think it was quite alarming because as when we're sort of first introduced to the the two characters in question, uh, one of them is sort of crooning over a long lost lover. And she's like sort of swiftly chastised by the more worldly, smart one and told that she should be focusing on using her youth and her beauty and her sexuality to get ahead rather than wasting it on notions of romanticism. And yeah, I think that that's sort of the shift in values that we're seeing at the moment is there's less of a focus on um, romance and bonds and connection and more, more of a focus on how sexuality can be commodified, monetized, um, while one is still young and able to sort of capitalize on it. And this story kind of shows a very glamorous uh, portrayal of that arc playing itself out. 
But, well, I don't know about that. It's, uh, I mean, you're invited, I think, to compare those characters, um, Lucia and I can't remember the other character's name, um, to the, I, I think, to the wives of the, of like the couples who are at the hotel who are, uh, yeah, have also, you know, come into great wealth by using their beauty and their sexual appeal, et cetera. And I, I think the creators of the show want you, I could be wrong, want you to question, or like, I, I, don't, I don't think they're coming at it with sort of cons social conservative values, right? I think they're trying to say that there is a greater resemblance between these two paths to, to, to wealth and success than people are comfortable admitting. Um, that, like, that's the subtext I'm reading into what they're saying, but I could be wrong. Mm. I, I'm, I mean, uh, there's multiple, there's definitely multiple ways of, of viewing it. Um, but I do see the fact that um, despite the fact that these two women um, are shown being opportunistic, are shown putting both themselves and like other people in danger, the fact that they kind of literally uh, dance off into the sunset <laughs> at the end um, kind of shows you that I guess our attitudes are are changing and I guess it's I'm not necessarily saying it has like a, a judgmental look or that it's making any sort of value judgment, but it definitely is showing a kind of stark vision of what society looks like when commodifying one's sexuality is like normal and, and normalized. Um, but isn't it hasn't so, it been normal yeah. all I mean, sex work is the oldest profession there is. I mean, there's nothing new about I mean people probably people sell um, sex in the in the strictly in the prostitution frame we're talking about like to a lesser degree than ever right because like, this used to be one of the of most course. common of course yeah, but ahead. in terms of it being like frowned upon versus it not being frowned upon like of course sex work has, has existed throughout most of human history but there are certain ebbs and flows in terms of whether a culture embraces it um, as like a norm for young women or whether it's seen as something fringe and 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 repressed and I guess here we're sort of seeing it as an empowered archetype a fantasy that a lot of young women are embracing and sort of living vicariously through yeah and I wonder like how you see this um, in relation to the me too movement because um, in a way, uh, the Me Too movement took, in, in certain situations, um, what could have been seen as transactional, transactional sexual encounters in which, you know, a woman was using her sexuality to get ahead or a man was asking that as the price, right, for getting ahead. You know, during the Me Too movement, that was seen as real violation um, and the idea that a, a, a young, beautiful woman could could have consented to such a transactional sexual encounter with somebody as gross as Harvey Weinstein, let's say, right, was unthinkable, right? It must have been rape. It must have been um, forced on her, right? Whereas this seems like almost like a, a, a corrective to that, a, um, a turning on that view and saying, no, 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 no. When you're young and beautiful, you're the one with the power because you get to set mm -hmm. the price. Um, do you see this as a kind of like rebuke of, of the Me Too movement? Almost, but I, I also see it as emblematic of a certain kind of um, cognitive dissidence that we're currently holding in culture when it comes to female sexuality and how it's expressed in the public domain. Um, at the, at, at, on one end, uh, there's a sort of panic around, uh, you know, women's safety and, uh, you know, women's rights and things like that. But at the same time, sexuality and the commodification of sexuality is seen as this really empowering thing. And I think that mm. the realities of sex work, the more brutal realities are kind of an impairment to the emergence of the <laughs> this archetype of the empowered um, sex worker. And um, I think a lot of the contradictions we're seeing is the fact that we don't really want to let go of this archetype of the empowered sex worker. We love it so much because it's so much fun. I mean, it's almost like watching a Sofia Coppola film. It's this fantasy of feminine excess. Whereas at the same time, there is the more ad abject dimension of it, which is in stark contrast to the empowering vision that's sort of being sold to young women. So, yeah, I definitely see this deep tension that people are having a difficult time reconciling for sure. Mm -hmm. The first season of White Lotus, which mostly starred different characters, I, I thought was almost more political in that it, it seemed to, to me to have an anti-woke agenda, or the, or, or rather the the characters who were the most like stereotypically woke were set up, in my view, to be the villains, like the two the the teenage girls, um, who uh, like are like she, the the one girl is kind of always fighting with her mom, who's more of like a 
Hillary Clinton feminist, and uh, and and these girls are they <laughs> really really villainous within the context of the show, in my view. But um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Angie. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and we'll have more rising right after this.